anointed and empowered, and so our, uh, what I will do every time I'm on this series, I will do a little bit of recap, and you may think to yourself, well, I don't like that. Well, I don't like it either, but I've got to get everybody on board. Some people haven't been here. We're always going to have new people. We want to get them at least to a place where they know uh, for this day where we're going to, we, we can go together and be in the same position, okay? So uh, 1 Kings 19, 16, and then 19 through 21, the Bible says, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mechola, you shall anoint his prophet in your place. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, that's, that's page one. I'm, I, I forgot, I downloaded this again, and uh, so I'm, <laughs> how many times are you going to do that till I get to page number 33? Where are you at? Page 22. Okay, here we go. 33. All right. 2 Kings 2, 9 through 14. And so it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I'm taken away from you? And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And so he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. So in our text, we see two men that had the empowerment of God on their lives as his lead prophetic voices in the nation. Their ministries were not concurrent. Elijah came first, and he prepared the way for the prophetic ministry that would eventually be continued through Elisha. And in this series of messages, we're primarily focusing on Elisha, not Elijah. We just talked about Elijah the first time because he prepared for the ministry that was coming in Elisha. We highlighted the fact that in Hebrew, the name Elisha literally means God is salvation. In a roundabout way, he answers the question, the meaning of his name answers the question, what God does. And of course, the answer is God saves. What we want to do today, and what we're doing in these messages, is we're broadening the idea of what it means for God's salvation to occur in our lives. Because we have the idea as evangelicals, as uh, uh, Pentecostals, people that are considered by, by Catholics to be Protestants, we have the idea that salvation, uh, particularly in our modern world, ha carries the connotation of when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's part of salvation, but it's not all there is to salvation. God is not just interested in you having a good death. He's interested in you having a good life. The word salvation in the New Testament, one of the words used to translate the word salvation is the word sozo. And as we've expounded in previous teachings, the word sozo implies more than just freedom from the penalties of sin, as important as that is. We're not going to minimize that. That is super, super important. And, and the idea of having a place in heaven when we die is also super, super important. But the word itself is more expansive and includes in it the idea of making, uh, his, uh, making people safe, sound, and really speaks more to the idea of wholeness. God wants his people whole, and salvation means wholeness, in every area of life. He wants you to be so spirit, I mean whole spiritually, absolutely. And you know, the more closer you get to death, because the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment, everybody's going to die unless Jesus comes back first. Everybody's going to die. And the older you are, the closer you are to dying. I'm sorry to be morbid, but that's the truth. But, you know, if you're a Christian, that's not morbid. It's actually a release into eternity, right? So the older you get, the more you think about dying. But the younger you are, you're not there yet. You're thinking about living. So we do all want to have that understanding that 
we're good with God. If something were to happen to us, we know we're going to heaven, and that's important. But God doesn't just want you whole in your spirit. He wants you whole in your mind. He wants you whole in your emotionally. He wants you whole uh, in your uh, financial realm. He wants you your family whole. He wants your relationships whole. He wants you whole financially. Now, I know when preachers talk about finances, you get the idea that I'm always trying to get all my money. No, biblically, Jesus wants you whole financially. He doesn't want his people in debt. He wants his people whole. Now, we're not promising that God's people are going to be uh, 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 debt-free in the sense that I can just do whatever I want, I can buy whatever I want, and God's going to take care of all my stuff. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not saying that he can't. We've got to learn how to be good stewards of what God's given to us as well. But what we also want to learn, and this is the reason I'm talking about this, is because we're really going to look about how salvation can impact your finances. We, we're... But it's not just all about how good of a steward you are. It's also about God's supernatural touch upon your finances. God wants you to be whole in the area of your finances. We have a part to play, but he has a part to play as well. Amen? So sometimes when people live the Christian life, they live it the best that they can, and God's not involved in it. And sometimes people want to live... Uh, life without being involved in it at all and trying just going out there and looking in the mailbox for God to send him a check. But you know, our name is Bethel. Bethel was the place where Jacob saw a ladder and the ladder bridged heaven and earth. So it's not just about all heaven and it's not just about all earth, it's about where heaven and earth meet. It's both of us, God being involved in our life, we having a part to play, but God also having a part to play in our lives as well. Now, how many of you know God has the greater part, but we also have a part to play? When it came to Moses and the Red Sea, how many of you know that Moses did not part the Red Sea? Who parted the Red Sea? God. But Moses had a part to play. If he didn't hold up his, his staff, then God wasn't going to do his part. Moses had to do his part, and when Moses did his part, it released God to do his part. God's part was so much more greater and so much more expansive, but we still have a part to play. Moses lifted his staff up by faith because God told him to do it, and when he did it and lifted it up by faith, then God did his part, which was to part the sea. I used to think faith was, man, if I just hold my staff up uh, and I'm strong enough, I can part the sea. No, you're not parting the sea. God parts the sea. But it doesn't mean that it takes, doesn't take faith to do what God says so that God can do what he's going to do. Amen? So anyway, in our text, we see that Elisha has received the mantle, which is the empowerment of God to accomplish the purposes of God. God's salvation is God's power made available to bring wholeness into every capacity of life. It was not just healing for the souls, but healing for their entire being, spirit, soul, body, relationships, finances, and society, that all, the, all the, the things that make up society where people function. This is what we mean when we speak of the word salvation. It brings healing into every dimension of our being and to the society which human beings partake of in the, in the place where we live. It's God's kingdom, order, and power being made manifest and realized in our everyday lives on earth as it is in heaven. Why is God wanting to do this? First of all, because we were fashioned in his image and his likeness, and he is restoring his creation to the way he created it to be. See, a lot of people think that the cross, and, and, and I'm gonna, i got to be careful how I say this, but that the cross is the end of everything. And I don't look at it that way. I look at the cross as the beginning of everything, right? So it's kind of like when the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, you could look at that as the end. But it wasn't the end, it was the beginning. The beginning of what? The Israelites going into the promised land. Not living in the wilderness, not living at the Jordan River, but going into the promised land. Right? So the cross 
what happened was when God created Adam and Eve, we were created in perfect harmony with the world and with God. We were put in this perfect environment. And we sinned. When we sinned, we disconnected from God, and we were no longer uh, 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 God's instruments to bring heaven into earth. We were more influenced by earth than we were by heaven, right? So what happened at the cross of Calvary is Jesus restored the relationship with God so that we could now get about to doing what God created us to do from the beginning, to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it, to bring God's heaven, the garden, a type of God's heaven, into the rest of the earth, to bring what God is doing in here into the realms where we live, to bring God's kingdom, for the kingdom of God is within you, wherever you go, and the, the power and the superiority of God's way of living life through you into the world around you. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when we get saved, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's my way of looking at things. You can look at it differently, and that's okay. I'm just telling you how I look at things. And since I have the pulpit, that's what we're going to go with this morning. So first, because we were fashioned in his image and his likeness, he's restoring his creation to the way he created it to be. Second, what we may not always realize, you probably heard this phrase, wounded people wound people. Right? Hurt people hurt people. That's just what happens. Bitter, angry people lash out, even when there's no reason for it to be because they're hurting inside. A bitter, angry, hurt people, they... They drink, they do drugs to cover up their pain, and what they do hurts the other people around them. Hurting people hurt people. The uh, flip side of that is whole people heal people. Whole people are God's instruments to bring wholeness into the world. So God doesn't want you saved but sick saved but ailing, saved but less than. He wants you saved and he wants you whole because in your wholeness, you can bring wholeness to others because life doesn't end with you. We're a very self-centered society, me, myself, and I. There's three of us. <laughs> Went over your head, right? All right. So, uh, we're a very self-centered society, very narcissistic in some ways. We're very self-centered. It's all about me. Now, that's not just our society. That's the human race, but it's very prevalent today, right? You ever seen uh, people that have phones, and you look at their phones, and there's a thousand pictures of themselves? What do they call them? They don't call them other people They call them selfies. Because they're taking pictures of themselves, right? Well, God is interested in you, but he actually put you on the earth to be his vessel to help other people. <gasps> blasphemy. In the devil's kingdom, it's blasphemy. In God's kingdom, that's the way of life, right? And we're not trying to learn, we're not trying to perpetuate the life we used to live. We're trying to learn how to live the kingdom life. Self-centered is the way of the world. Self-sacrifice is the way of the kingdom. Well, I don't like that. What you'll find, though, is Jesus' self-sacrifice made other. He became poor that others could become rich. If you humble yourself, God will lift you up. When you serve others by giving, there's a principle that says give and it shall be given unto you. That's the way things work in the kingdom. 
you cannot outgive God. And I'm not talking about finances. I'm talking about any dimension. When you serve, when you minister, whatever you do, you're giving of yourself, giving of your talents, giving of what you have. You're giving it to others. And, and I don't... Okay, let me, let me stop here because I'm realizing that our society is a little bit different, particularly for young people. Uh, today, young people are delaying having kids. Uh, that's just a product of our society. We're not, you know, but the reality is they don't understand because they don't have children what it is to give without getting anything in return. You love. You see something that can do nothing for you. And you love them. You'll die for them. You'll give everything you have. You will deny yourself for their health, for their welfare. If it costs you everything, you make a decision in that moment when you see that thing that you love, that if I have to waste and expend myself to the bone for your welfare, I will do it because that's what love does. We don't understand that. But that's God's kind of love. And that's what God wants for us. The only thing is, when we, when we do that, when we recognize love, love God, not with some of your heart, all your soul, all your mind, love your being, but there's another dimension to that. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that love look like? Self-sacrifice. you got to get out of yourself and into this mode where you realize God wants me to help other people. A lot of the struggles that we have, a lot of the things that we deal with are because we're very inward-centered. And we need to learn how to be outward-focused. But you won't be outward-focused if you don't feel like you have anything to give. Right? <laughs> I haven't even started the message yet. Let me, let me keep going. So, um, so anyway, the purpose for today, we're going to be looking at one particular uh, a passage of scripture, and I t entitled this this part of the series "Empowered to Bring Financial Liberation" is the point. Second Kings four one through seven. Uh, we've actually preached on this before, but I'm just going to bring out a few more highlights. Okay, uh, certain women of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, "Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant fear the Lord, and the creditors coming to take my two sons to be slaves." And basically, she's saying, "So what are you going to do about it?" This would be a good time to turn on your phones and video what's about to happen. Because this woman ain't happy. And it looks like something's about to go down. You know, when you see some two people arguing in the parking lot, you get your phone, you start recording. Right? <laughs> you see, something's about to happen, and I want to catch this on camera. Well, something's about to happen here. Because this woman's confronting Elisha, and he said, he's my husband, but he was your servant as well. What are you going to do about it? Elisha, the man of God, he says to her, what shall I do for you? And he turns it around. What do you have in your house? Well, she weren't expecting that. She was expecting a check. Some of y'all don't know what check is. She was expecting a Venmo transfer. You didn't think I knew what that was, did you? I do know what that is. She was expecting some financial remuneration. But he turned it around and said, what do you got in your house? And she said, and this is a Rick Helgero version, but this is how I see it. She, she's still defiant. Nothing. Now, it don't say anywhere in here there was a pause, but it don't say there wasn't. Nothing. He just looked at her. But he got the Spirit of God in his life. He got the empowerment of God. He got what you call a prophetic stare. And when somebody's prophetically staring at you, they are searching every area of your life. And she's like, ooh, I said nothing. Do I really have nothing? Oh, my gosh. Do I have nothing? Uh, my, my closet? I ain't got nothing in my closet. She's searching her whole house in her mind. And the only thing she can come up with is, I got a little vial of oil. It's amazing you went from having nothing to something. You don't need, he didn't say, how much do you have? He said, what do you have? And we always try to um, quantify that instead of just searching for something. 
well, that doesn't mean anything, or that won't do anything, or that's not worth anything. That's not what he was asking. What do you have in your house? Now, in the New Testament, the house can be used as a metaphor for your life. What do you got in your life? Nothing. And that's where you need the prophetic to jolt you, to help you to search inside. And she said, all I have is a little vial of oil. And he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. <laughs> you can imagine, she's like, you got to be kidding. Go borrow vessels from everywhere. In other words, get to work. From all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few of them. And when you come into your house, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into all these vessels and set aside the full ones. And so here's, you got to give credit where credit is due. This woman did it. I want to tell you something. I've been in ministry for a long time. I've been pastoring for a long time. A lot of people don't do what I tell them. If you're asking me biblical advice, they really don't. What I come to find out is people don't really want biblical advice. They want, they want someone to agree with them. This is what I want to do. I want you to pray for me that God will do it. Well, is it biblical? Uh, uh, is this what the scripture says? This is what the verse says. No, 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 no. And you can't get a word in edgewise. They just want what they want. Right? Well, that's not how it works. You go to the Word of God. You get a word from the Lord. And when you get a word from the Lord, whether it's what you want or not, I'm sure this woman didn't want to go take that little vial and borrow vessels from all her neighbors. I'm sure she was embarrassed. She probably didn't want anybody knowing what she had or what she was going through or the difficulties that she had, but she got a word from God. And when she got a word from God, she worked the word of God. She didn't, she didn't, she may have had thoughts in her mind, but he said, I got to go borrow vessels, let's go borrow vessels. It probably ain't going to work, but I'm going to do it anyway. I, if it don't work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these vessels to him and tell him to fill it up. They don't say that in there. It's just, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, so she went, shut the door behind her, and he, their sons brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. So what was happening is, she did what she was told to do, and when she did what she was told to do, God did what he was going to do. You see, we want God to do what he's going to do without us doing what we're supposed to do. We want it to be all God and none of us. After we've been to the place where it was all us and none of God. I call Visa. I call MasterCard. I even, it got so bad, I called Discover. We, did, we called everybody. I call uncle. I call aunt. And, you know, they blocked my number because I call them so much. Right? I call, I call Uncle Sam. I call Better Business Bureau. I call Small Business Loans. I call FEMA. I call Allstate. And I ain't calling them no more. I call everybody that I can call, and so I guess I'm going to have to call on God. Correct. But when we call on God, it's like, okay, God, I'm telling you what I want. Thank you very much. I'll wait till you do it. It's a lot of people's mentality, too. But remember, heaven, the ladder bridges heaven and earth. God has a part to play, but we also have a part to play. She had a part to play in this scenario, and that was the poor. God's part to play was to keep the poor going. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So anyway, this woman, in what we find here is she was in the middle of financial, I like this word, so I'm going to use it again, pickle. Right? Not a sweet pickle because I don't like that. Maybe it was a sweet pickle, because I don't like her situation either. But dill pickles, I can tolerate them. Forget sweet pickles. <laughs> Trying to fill up space here. Anyway, okay. So anyway, she was in a pickle, and what we're going to see is that a divine power from God came to free this woman as she received and ultimately put into action the word of the Lord given to her through the anointed and empowered man of God. The supernatural flow to free this woman from her financial prison began to bring God's divine provision into her life. While it may seem like it was a once and done thing, the provision was actually manifested in her life 
through a process. It took time. But what is of utmost importance to us is that it was still supernatural. You can go home without a word from God and take a jar of oil and pour it, and it ain't going to take long until it's empty. What made the jar continue to pour is she had a word from God. You understand what I'm saying? It's the word from God. It's us. We have our part to play, but God does his part. So there were a few things that took place in this woman's life that brought her to the place of freedom from financial imprisonment to financial liberation. How many of y'all would like to be free from financial burdens and free to do whatever it is that God wants you to do? Okay, so there's only three hands over here Raise up. No, y'all are too late. So... I'm going to preach to these three people that raise their hand. And I had my hand raised too, so I'm preaching to myself. All right, so the word of the Lord is going to go to them because y'all missed your chance. No, no, no. How many of y'all would like to be free from financial debt and burden? All right? I can't do it. I can give you the word of God. And as you implement the word of God in your life, God has promised that his word is not without power. And God is faithful to his word. And he actually said, test me in this, try me in this, and see if I want to do this for you. So, first thing we need to realize is this woman need a, needed a freedom from. In order to, we're going to look at the next part of this in a minute, but we're going to concentrate on freedom from. First thing she needed a freedom from, remember she said, your, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know my servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be a slave. Now, we don't do that anymore, but that used to be very common. You had something called debtor's prison because they couldn't pay their debts, and they would get thrown in prison. But that didn't happen. That's, Israel was actually uh, one of the few nations that had this jubilee where every, was it every 50 years, there was a jubilee that happened where people that were in debt would be set free. You try to convince Visa to do that, and you're in trouble. Anyway, um, she, was, she needed freedom from, the very first thing she needed freedom from was debt. The first thing we want to highlight is that this woman was in debt, not just any debt. It must have been a massive debt that required not only forfeiture of her farm and house, but also required the servitude of her sons in order to bring her freedom from this cruel taskmaster. She had to have a freedom from mammon. Now, you say, mammon's not in this text. No, but the Bible is a cohesive whole. And Jesus brought out that uh, later on in the New Testament that in order to get a freedom from debt, you've got to be free from mammon. What is mammon? The next thing we're going to see in the New Testament is that the real enemy we must be delivered from in order to, be ex to experience financial liberation is a deliverance from the spirit of mammon. What is mammon? Mammon is a spirit whose influence manifests in materialism or the love of money. Now listen, you don't have to have a lot to be a slave to materialism. In fact, you might say that people that are hoarders are also, could be, not all of them, but in some sense are a slave to materialism because they're afraid of not having enough. You could have millions of dollars and live in poverty because you're afraid of not having enough. So your trust is not in God, your trust is in a spirit, or what we were going to call mammon, and what mammon can do for you. And mammon can, can promise you all sorts of stuff, but it will have you living in poverty. Anyway, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus' warning here is thus not specifically against ill-gotten wealth, but about possessions as such which, however neutral their character, can become a focus of concern and greed which competes for the disciples' loyalty with God himself. The principle of materialism is inevitable conflict with the kingship of God. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is a root of 
all kinds of evil. Some people read it as, as a root of evil, but it's not root. It's a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What does that mean? Doing things His way. See, mammon will tell you in order to have more, the last thing you want to do is give. You need to hoard. You need to save. You need to be stingy. You need to pinch penny. Now, it's okay to spend money on yourself, but don't give it away to anybody else that's particularly people that don't deserve it. Church don't deserve it. What do they do for you? People that are hurting don't deserve it. What do they do for you? They should be out there. Remember, remember Ebenezer Scrooge? Uh, well, don't they have this, or they should have been doing that? He found all ways of justifying his uh, 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 inability to give because he was consumed with mammon. And how did he live? Like a pauper. The whole point of that story is that true riches manifest when you give. But you won't give if your God or your idol is mammon. If I give to you, I won't have enough for myself. If I do this, I won't have enough to do this. If I do this, I won't have enough to do this. And what you're actually doing is you're like the woman with the vial of oil who refuses to pour because I only have a little bit left. You see, the only way that you can truly pour is when you get your eyes and your devotion off mammon and get your eyes and your devotion on God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and His way of doing things, and all these things shall be added to you. In the parable of the sower, in Matthew 13, we're going to look at it here in a minute, what we have re revealed to us is an, another side of mammon, which is the enemy's tactics he uses to sidetrack and derail those who would follow after Christ. If he cannot keep the follower from moving forward in the word, he'll seek to make life so hard for him that he crashes into a ditch on the other side. If this is unsuccessful, the next tactic is to distract and cause them to fall into a ditch on the other side of the road. And the distraction that he uses is the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. In other words, he puts an idol in your life which has more sway in your life than God. Matthew 13, 22. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. How do you choke the word? By not heeding and doing the word. So if you're not listening to and doing the word, you are listening to someone. And what you're listening to is you're listening to the enemy working through a spirit of mammon that is teaching you and telling you not to do that. You can't do that. You need that for yourself. You need that for your kids. You need that for the house you want to build. You need that for the better car you're going to buy. You need that for you. You're not going to give it away. But the problem is then what happens is, and what you don't realize, is that the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches is a tool of the enemy to keep you from having a, a, a freedom in God. And that freedom in God is what opens the supernatural flow of God to impart unto you more than just what you have, but to bring more resources into your life because God now sees an open hand and not a closed fist. See, when you have an open hand, it freely gives, but it also freely receives. When you have a closed hand, which is what mammon and the deceitfulness of riches will do, it will keep your hand from giving, but it also keep your hand from receiving. Am I making sense to you? Okay. So how do we actually get free from the pull of materialism? The same way the woman in our text was set free. She heard and implemented the word of God that dealt with her financial liberation. As she obeyed the word from Elisha, the power of God saved her and set her free from financial bondage. 
the Bible says, James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. She began by recognizing that she had something to give. You see, the, the world will always tell you, you don't have enough to give. This woman definitely did not have enough to give. But the word of God taught her to pour. You got to give away what you have. You got to begin where you're at. You begin to give. You begin to pour. And she began recognizing that. And as she began to pour or give in obedience to the word of God, she started with little, but that little began to flow supernaturally until she found herself with much. Doesn't the Bible say, Give and it shall be given unto you? Luke 6, 38, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It will be put into your bosom, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. You always got to learn how to give by faith. Not trusting in your account, but trusting in God. And you may only make $500 a week, and so where do you start giving that first week? Well, let's say you make $50. You only made $50 this week. You give $5. Well, that $5 is, you know, is a meal. It's a hot dog at, at uh, Chevron, you know. <laughs> it's, it's something, you know. It's a, it's a hot dog and a drink. It's, it's, it might be all I get for today. I'm not going to give $5. You know, there's no way. And so you hold on to that $5. But, you know, as you begin to trust the Lord where you're at, you'll find that God will take care of you. He's promised in his word. We're not going to touch on all the promises, but he's promised in his word. You trust God. You give away the $5, but you got to look at it not as I'm losing something, but I'm investing into something. Okay, you know, when people had, a, today it doesn't work this way as much because the government got their hands in it. But before the government got their hands in it, they used to have uh, your crops were also seed. So if you grew corn, your corn was what you ate, but your corn was also what you planted. Right? Nowadays, the government took that away from you. You have to keep buying seed from the government if you want to have corn. They call it genetically modified, I forgot what the O stands for. But you can't plant corn that comes, that's been genetically modified. You have to keep buying seed. But old time crops, you would take your crops and you would eat. And if you had, a, if you had a, 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 enough of a crop to make it through the winter, you had to make a decision. Well, you know what? If I don't eat all my crops, I'm going to have some times of starvation or I'm going to have some times where it's going to be lean. But if I don't plant my crops, I'm not going to have anything next year. So I've got to learn how to give by planting even when it's difficult. So I have to take some of my seed. That's why the Bible says weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Because I'm having to eat, I'm having to plant some of the seed that I could be eating right now. But if you look at your tithe, not as losing, but as planting, as investing, then what you're, in, what you're ensuring is a future harvest. And when your next harvest starts to get bigger, then you're able to plant more. And if you're able to plant more, it ensures a greater harvest. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Right? So I may be giving $5 right now because I make $50 a week, but God begins to bless, God begins to move, I get a little bit better job, I get a little promotion, and now maybe I'm making, after a couple of years, I'm making $500, and I'm giving $50, you know? But i got to continue to plant because if I don't plant, I'm not going to reap i got to continue to invest, because if I don't invest, I'm not going to see the fruit of that. It's all God. It's supernatural, but God's doing His work. So I just obey God. I do what the Word of God says. And then the next thing you know, man, mom, things are really going good. I got involved in a startup company. I'm really doing well now, making $5,000 a week, you know. And you don't realize it, because it happens gradually. It happens over time. But you're making $5,000, and all of a sudden you sit down, and you go, you start to make out your time check, and you go, $500. That's a lot of money. I don't know if I want to give $500. But see, if you don't plant, you're not going to harvest. There was one guy that got in this particular scenario, and he said, oh, that's a lot of money. I don't know about giving $500. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, well, if, you, if you're comfortable giving $5 a week, I'll take you back to where all you have to give is $5. He said, no! <laughs> Proverbs 
Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your increase, and your barns will be filled with plenty, plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. So, second point, we said freedom from, but now we're going to look at freedom to, right? There's not much left in the message. We're almost done. Freedom, first of all, she was going to have a freedom to live. Some people can't really live because everything goes to their taskmasters. They're not free to do what they want to do because every, every spare dime they have goes to pay a debt. And they can't even pay off their debt because they're paying the interest on their debt. So for the rest of their lives, they're paying interest on a debt they can never pay down because they don't have enough money to do it. Well, this woman not only got a freedom from, she got a freedom too. First, freedom to live. Matthew 6, 25 through 30. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Not only a freedom to live, but a freedom to give. See, the next thing I want to bring out that Scripture makes clear for us in the New Testament is in God's provision to us, we have the freedom to allow God's provision to flow through us so that God can use us as instruments to take care of the people around us. Acts 2, 44 through 45. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now let me give you just a point here because you might say, well, I'm not rich, so that scripture doesn't apply to me. Have you ever heard, we're only going to tax, tax the top 1%? Yeah, top 1%, because that ain't me. See, we think very isolated. Globally, if you make more than $32,000 a year, you're in the top 1%. That means if you look at things globally, you're rich. No, I'm not. All depends on your perspective. And if you recognize that you are rich compared to many people in this world, then you, this scripture applies to you. And the Bible says, command those who are rich in this present age, which that's pretty much all of us here, not to be haughty, nor to trust in certain riches, but to trust in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good that they may be rich in good works. Now, I will tell you something you may not know, and I'm pretty much done. You cannot take your money with you. No matter what you think, no matter what the devil promises you, you cannot take your money with you. But when you get to heaven, you can use your money here to lay up for yourself treasures in heaven by the good that you do with the resources that God puts in your hands now. When you do good for others, when you do good works, when you give, when you share what you have, when you help other people around you, what you may not have here, you will have up there. Do you understand what I'm saying? we got to have a bigger picture than just where we're at. So in conclusion, in our text today, we look into the account of this widow woman and her financial problems, and what we saw is that a divine power from God came to save this woman as she received and ultimately put into action the word of the Lord given to her through the anointed and empowered man of God. The supernatural flow to free this woman from her financial prison began to bring God's divine provision into her life. And while it may seem like it was a once and done thing, the provision was actually manifested in her life through a process. 
So it's not just going to be, well, I'm going to give, and then if God doesn't do it, I'm not going to give anymore. No, it's got to be, I determine, I'm going to obey the word, I'm going to do what God's word says. And as you continually do what God's word says, you will see the power of God released in your life, and you will see God's word manifest. Well, uh, uh, it took time and steadfastness on the part of the woman, but as she heeded the word of the Lord through Elisha, what is of utmost importance to us is that it was a supernatural freedom from her financial prison. Please understand. It wasn't pouring a small vial of oil in and of itself that set her free. It was the Word of God, believing the Word of God, acting on the Word of God, being willing to give in, uh, in, in agreement with the Word of God that released the power of God and brought supernatural sustenance into her life. Am I making sense to you? Not only was she freed from something, but she was also freed to something. She was freed from her bondage to truly experience life. While not in the text, what we also saw from the New Testament is that true life manifests itself in giving. I do go to the chiropractor, and one of the sayings I love to read every time I go in there is that as I walk in, he has a sign up there that says, you make a living by what you get. You make a life by what you give. Amen? Seems like a weird scripture, I mean, a sermon to preach when we just went through a hurricane. But maybe it's the most appropriate scripture and sermon to focus on when we just went through a hurricane. Because when we just went through difficulties, what we want to do is we want to, we want to tighten everything up. We want to tighten up our belts. We want to make sure that, you know, we have because of this and that, you know, and there's all reasons why we won't and why we can't. But the Lord's wanting to remind us, I believe, today that it's not us. It's Him. And there are people all around us that need us to trust God enough to let free what we're holding on so tight to that others may experience His joy, His provision, what they need in life. And what the Lord is trying to remind us is that you can't outgive God. He will take care of you. He will provide for you because your sustenance is not in your bank account. Your sustenance is in Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. I don't know all the stories, but I was looking over here to Pilar. And I was kind of concerned about Pilar because she lives by herself. She basically, uh, uh, she's a true widow. She doesn't really have anybody to take care of her. I know Dell has family, and so we're grateful for that, even though she's a widow as well. Uh, but Pilar's pretty much on her own, you know, except for people around her that, that watch out for her. And so the hurricane came, and I know there's others in here too, and we're, but I'm used to using Pilar today as an example. And while I was worried about it, I didn't talk to my wife too much about it, but she was worried about her too. She actually went over there, and when she went over, I think this was, uh, was it Monday? No, Tuesday. It was Tuesday. All the power had been out. And um, I think she went over there on Tuesday because there's no cell service. You know, you, you can't get a hold. I tried to call lots of people. Couldn't get, a, couldn't get out. If you texted me, I probably got a couple hours later. Then I tried to go back, and I couldn't get it out. It's, it's like, won't go through, invalid text. You know, I hate that. But uh, anyway, she went over there, and she looks at Pilar's window, and the windows are closed, and she's thinking, oh, my gosh. Something's wrong with Pilar. Something's going on. You know, her windows are closed. She doesn't even have the windows up. Oh, it's, it's not good. And she knocks on the door, and she hears Pilar's voice. She says, I know who knocks like that. And she opens the door, and when she opens the door, the television is going, the air condition is on, and you're like, and Anna, Anna, the first thought that Anna had was God takes care of the widows and the orphans in their distress. Mm-hmm. 